Yang Speaks is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Your data is your business. Protect it at expressvpn.com slash yang. You have, at this point, de-radicalized. How many people would you say? Anywhere over 600 people, I think, now. If I am someone who's struggling uh, with trying to disengage from one of these uh, movements or organizations, uh, like, what is your approach to yeah. that person? It's typically never the ideology that they're after, right? The ideology is not attractive. It's illogical. It's irrational uh, to hate somebody based on the color of their skin. I mean, it's based on conspiracy theories and, and garbage. Uh, so it's not the ideology. So we have to understand um, as people are on this search for identity, community and purpose, which we all are at some point in our lives, sometimes multiple times in our lives, uh, we hit what I call potholes in our life's journey. And potholes are things like physical trauma and abuse, uh, could be uh, mental illness, it could be job loss, it could be grief, it could be poverty, it can also be privilege, if privilege keeps us too separate from humanity, it could be millions of different things. And those potholes lead us to the fringes, they detour us. And on the fringes, there are all sorts of narratives to try and comfort us, to try and uh, kind of take advantage of our vulnerability. White supremacists are waiting there too, to, to try and attract people with a narrative that takes their pain and projects it on to somebody else. So my goal when I work with people is really to listen uh, very closely to those potholes and then try and repair them as best as I can. Because once the potholes are repaired, we can work on replacing the toxic identity, community, and purpose that they've found, that they're getting a reward from, uh, with something that's more positive. back andrew did you watch the debate i know you watched the debate what do you think man <laughs> did i watch the debate i lived it and no i didn't quite live it but uh <laughs> i was uh you lived it in the studio i guess right yeah i lived in the studio that's true um and so uh watched it commentated on it and came away thinking that uh, Trump did a whole lot better than he did the first time. It really made you reflect on if he had delivered this performance the first time, uh, I think the dynamics of this race would be very different. But I think mm -hmm. that uh, by any standard, the first debate was the most important one. So if, if there was one that you did not want to tank, it was that one. Uh, and he, he did. And so his better performance this time, I don't think, will uh, change the dynamics of the race. But I think it will stop the bleeding somewhat where I think his support was uh shrinking um and it has been shrinking since the first debate and then him getting covid and then this general sense that his campaign's a mess uh, and then him his, him running around rallying in various uh states i i don't know if that has moved the needle uh it, it seems like uh frankly a kind of desperate uh, game plan like in in the final days particularly because some of the rallies have been in places that uh, are generally safely read and um, um, so that they're they're trying anything at this point um, but I, I do think it was a better performance for him uh, and think that uh, I found myself kind of like grateful that he hadn't didn't do this performance in the first debate he was good like Donald Trump was for him he was he was good he was clearly I think you tweeted he'd been he'd been he'd been coached in yeah, practice yeah you tweeted like Trump looked like he prepared which is a statement because I think I mean he like I think they they released press on this in 2016 that he prepared for Hillary in various ways I think Chris Christie was involved which is the stories I remember reading um but he looked more calm I think the nature of it where they were muting him um you could see like his like tendency to like kind of start interrupting and then kind of dialed it back at times um he was strong um that said i thought um this was one of joe's better performances um from like a he was articulate he was strong he fought, punched back pretty hard um i thought way better great moments great points he was flexible um he 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 both stayed on message and also seemed like he was very present like it, it, you never got the vibe where, uh, where he was just um going towards prepared talking points he was responding to trump in, in the moment 
Uh, I mm-hmm. agree with you. I thought I thought Joe was very strong at uh, various points. So here's my question for you: so we were, when we were running for president, um, the big thing was not just to do well in the moment, um, and actually, like by the numbers, like a lot of people tune out after the first thirty minutes or so, um, particularly in the primaries. I, I'm not sure about the presidentials, but it's probably something similar. Um, the big thing was, yeah, ideally you get a hit in or two in the early moments, um, but then you wanted the soundbite, you know, which we hated trying to fight for, and you particularly hated. I, I did too. Um, where you want that like little gotcha moment where the press can clip it, and then it's like, did you see that last night? Like Cory Booker said, Joe, you're you're drinking the wrong Kool Aid, whoever the hell they're selling. I I mean, you remember the shit. Um, and then what happened in the primary a lot was there, were other, there was other news cycles going on. There was an impeachment going on. There was uh, eventually coronavirus. But like the press, there used to be weeks almost of like earned media after a debate. And then it kept get shrinking and shrinking. And there was one debate we had where there was literally no earned. It was like you got that night coverage and maybe a little bit in the morning. And that was it. Um, so you don't get the bump. My question is like, what what is is anything? I haven't seen that much come out of this debate from a like press angle story there's a good amount about biden i think misspoke about how he wanted to get rid of oil which i probably not going to pull well pennsylvania and probably will hurt him particularly from attack ads from the trump administration uh, thoughts on what the media is spinning after this and what's happening um in the soundbite world i think uh i think they're kind of over it already honestly like i i don't yeah. think that they're going to be really clipping from this debate uh and um, Trump is an endless fountain of new content, so it, reporters can simply just go to his rallies and see what anytime they want yeah. quotes he's uh, <laughs> he's going to provide. You get your clicks. <laughs> I've been looking into what election night looks like, and we can talk some more about this. Um, yeah. But there are a lot of variables, uh, and the the main variable is around. Um, states that can report that night and then states that probably will not be able to. Um, so Mm -hmm. I think that's where the press is going to head. Honestly, I think the press is going to start trying to prepare the public for election night because it's not going to be the usual, okay, we're there. We watch it. Uh, you announce the winner, uh, someone concedes, and then we know who the president is at, let's call it, uh, 1130 Eastern time. Um, like it, it seems like that probably does not play out this time. So I, I think that that's where the press is heading. So I'm, uh, you know, you and I now like are, a part of our career is tied to politics, right? So I have, um, and now that I'm off the race, my friends feel a little better about texting me because I'm, I'm a little bit, definitely better about responding. Um, so I'm, I'm getting my Republican friends and my, um, cause I, I have family in Florida. I grew up outside of Hartford and, um, right. And so I have people, friends all over the spectrum. And to me, it feels like Republicans and Democrats are in completely different worlds right now. Like they, like one, on one hand, there's a fandom aspect, like you're rooting for your guy and, you know, you hear what you want to hear and, you, you know, you're, you're rooting for, you know, the Republicans thought Trump did well and the Democrats thought Biden did pretty well too. Like that, that you know, that, that's standard most of the time. But I think we're like the Republic, the right and the left and some of the social media stuff we talked about, like they're just feeding us different shit all the time. And so I, I want your thoughts on this. Like, to me, the worst case scenario is actually not Trump winning if you if you don't like Trump. Right. It's actually to me where no one knows the source of truth and who fucking won. You know what I'm saying? Where um, if Trump's like, it's not over, you know, it's the prolonged process where yeah. it drags on for days and weeks uh, and the, and people don't just stand idly by during those days and weeks of people protest people uh, in some cases p- potentially uh, are violent or destroy property or, or um, you know something that's uh, truly destructive that's a real danger I mean that that's yeah. I, I think uh, again why the press is going to be turning towards what the mechanics will look like on election night and thereafter because many people in the press are going to be trying to dampen um, mm-hmm. a- any unrest um, but there is going to be some I'm sure uh, media figures at the margins like the assholes the folks who, who are um, better served by something nasty and dramatic happening who might be fanning the flames so uh, you know and the fact is 
we're days away from voting and at this point almost 50 million americans have already voted including me yeah, uh, yeah and, same and here so, we did it yes yeah, <laughs> we did it so if you haven't voted join <laughs> here, here. Me and Zach join and the club we did 40 it 40 some odd million we can do it you definitely can do it because we yeah we're not great my voting record yeah, is not sterling vote. let's put it that way so that the mechanics are, are hugely important and the if you're with joe and kamala uh the states to keep an eye on in terms of an early result would be florida and north carolina um yes if they report and they go to joe then this could be a wrap election night and they they can count theirs before election night so they should be able to report relatively on time compared to other states like i believe it I think it's Ohio. I can't remember. They can't start counting until election day, right? The 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 three late counting states, uh, bully for them, uh, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> um, uh, the the three to keep an eye on that are slow are Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And okay, well, as you can uh-huh. tell, those those are key battleground states. So if you want to avoid a long process, you need to get a pretty good looking sweep of some big electoral prizes like Florida and North Carolina, if you're Joe. The flip side is that Trump can win Florida and North Carolina, and he frankly should be favored to win both those places. They're both like a little bit right-leaning. Yeah. Um, so he can win those and Joe can still win, ultimately win. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it's it's funny, it's one-way traffic where if Florida and North Carolina go for Joe, it's probably a wrap. Um, if Florida and Carolina go for Trump, it is not a wrap. Um, mm-hmm. It just means that the the process is going to drag on, and Trump may call it a wrap if that's you know he's going to call it a wrap at some point. Um, theoretically, that's a little terrible. All he does tweet I won, concede Joe, whatever it is, and we have a a civil war. I don't know what do we do then. I don't know. We have a we have a press and media narrative war and probably a series of protests of some kind. Um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, the social media companies have said they're going to clamp down on any uh, unverified or un um independently stated victory proclamation so our buddy jack our buddy alexis from reddit uh jack dorsey at twitter mark zuckerberg is not our buddy but uh like hopefully they do they do democracy a favor if you will and this does put pressure on the media organizations who will be the independent verifiers If you're listening to this show, you probably love podcasts. I want to recommend one that we've been listening to and and dabbling into and um, that has some fascinating stuff that's made for the Yang Gang in many ways or made for our listeners in many ways. So the Jordan Harbinger Show is what we're talking about. And I just listened to one with a guy named David Shimmer who comes and talks about how our elections have been kind of covertly interfered with for the past 100 years. So like election interference is not new. It is something that's been happening for a while. Sometimes it's foreign. Sometimes it's harmless. Sometimes it doesn't affect the election at all. Sometimes it's massive. And it was really fascinating to listen to this guy. uh, Just uh, Jordan just has this ability to talk to some of those brilliant minds out there and make it simple for us to simple and actionable for us to take things away. So search for the Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H A R B as in boy, I N as in Nancy, G E R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So that's Jordan Harbinger Show. You can Google it. You can find it on podcasts. And it's um, it's worth your time. It's worth your energy. It's worth your intellectual curiosity, frankly. So a ton of interesting people. Check it out. Jordan Harbinger Show. He's the harbinger of knowledge. We're in touch with the Biden team and, and in, in their uh, relative inner circles. Um, you know, not inner inner, but you know, we're, we're in the loop on some stuff. And... There's so much, there's so many logistics around mail-in voting and remote voting and like the way that's happening this year. And to me, what I'm scared of, and I will have your thoughts on this, what what scares me is that if you're Trump, you have the White House, um, an entire administration and staff and infrastructure to navigate this um, across the country. And if you're Joe, you've had to build that from scratch, right? Like if you need people on the ground dealing with the secretary of state in Ohio or Florida or dealing with the, frankly, the post offices in various counties and states all over the country, Joe's had to build that from scratch, Um, you know, literally hiring people on the fly as you go. Uh, Does that freak you out? Like, that's what's scary to me, where it's like, I think the Dems could pull this off, but it's going to be tight and the margin of error is going to lean towards 
Republicans or the, the incumbent, if you will. You know, I, from what I've heard, it seems like they've mobilized a lot of resources in those directions, like around uh, they have, yeah, they have a lot of money and lawyers and the rest of it. Yeah. So, uh, and they're they're, they're competent. Um, where I, I don't think they're just going to not see that particular quote unquote battleground coming. Um, I mean, they do see it coming, and I know they're staffing up for it. Yeah, yeah, they're smart. I mean, Jen, I mean, Jen, their campaign manager is is, is really sharp. Um, so uh, this to kind of close the loop on this, this was a debate recap, if you will. I don't think anything tr- super fundamental, except um, there, if there are people that were like leaving the Trump train because they thought he was off the rails in the last debate, they may have jumped back on given his pretty good performance. Um, I hate these debates. I think they're actually a waste of time, generally speaking. I would love to ask you this, and I kind of talked about it last time we did a debate recap. If you had to fix the debates, because you're great at these ideas, how would you fix them? Like if you were like blank slate, Andrew Yang creates the debate. You're not in it, uh, let's say, in this in, in this made up fantasy I'm having. How would you, how would you structure them to you? Uh, I would try and build something that actually takes advantage of modern technology. So something asynchronous, where, um, for example, you could ask both candidates ten questions. They have X. Let's call it a minute to answer or two minutes to answer each question, and just play the recordings. And then you can watch it uh, ahead of time. Um, and then when you show up for the debate, you could have follow-ups instead of you sort of dig beneath like the first two minutes of content. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. The problem in these dates is that um, they revolve around certain subject areas that you you can prepare for. You know, you can go to like a couple of um, uh, of canned answers, uh, and so um, instead of frankly, like being like, hey, what do you think about this, uh, like policy on the superficial level, you could just do that ahead of time. Um, right. And then you could spend the debate doing something uh, deeper and try and elicit um, more real info for voters. Um, so that that's my idea. Um, you'd, you'd have a little bit of pre work, I think it'd be a bonanza for a lot of these networks too, personally, because it still makes yeah. the live thing super important. Right. Um, you know, but but then you, you could have like a touch point ahead of time, there'd be more genuine information. Um, yeah, getting transferred to the public too. That is, I've never thought of that Andrew. And I think, so one of the things you watch in this debate, it's like, they're both arguing their own set of facts, you know, where they cite their own studies and look for every one study that says climate change is real. There's another fewer and fewer, frankly, but there's, there's another, it says it's, you know, it's not man-made or happening without us, or it's a hoax or whatever the hell you want. You know, what I really dislike Zach is the spin afterwards where it's like, talk oh, about man. alternate realities. You go to the teams and you're oh, like, how did I go? And then it does not matter what happened. The team's like, <laughs> like my candidate was incredible. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> in, the face, in, the, in, the, in the face of any evidence, like, you know, like, um, Dude, dude, dude. No, no. We need to we need to do our listeners a favor and just kind of walk them through what the fucking spin room is like. Because the average American has no idea what this is. It's I'll start at just so you walk after the debate, they funnel you, they herd you like cats through these like little winding areas, and then they dump you in a big room, which is usually freezing cold. Um, and it's shaped basically like an L where all the networks have their little boots around it, where they're live on like the CNN panel and all the stuff you see. And then in the middle is what I no other way to describe it but a shit show of reporters like just a fucking swarm paparazzi style of just mics in your face and then the candidates come in so if you're not that if you're not the front runner right if you're like let's call it michael bennett and you've got a bunch of reporters on it because the only candidate there but then joe biden walks in all the reporters just literally run away from you they just fucking say peace out Oh man, there's Joe Biden. They just leave you mid-interview. And like, I mean, like, talk me more about like your experience here, because it wasn't me. I was the one like hurting you around, but you were the one with the mics in your face, and then having them ripped out of your face. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was always bizarre, uh, and there was like a hierarchy in the media around like candidates. Where for us, depending upon how hot we were at a particular moment in time, yeah. it'd be like uh, you know you can like queue up and like wait your turn, or you could not and uh um uh, you know and then they're, they're always like trying i mean they called it the spin room you're always like pushing these narratives um i think some of like the top tier candidates just skipped it um you know I yeah uh, joe like almost never did it um warren barely did it 
But they would get, like, physically assaulted. Like, I remember catching Elizabeth Warren and her staffer because reporters were tripping over themselves and they're, like, falling. I go, oh. Yeah, because there, there are some people from, like, marginal press outlets that are just trying to get a juicy quote. Oh, yeah. the new Like, the Norwegian outlet's always there, like, in your face. Like, whatever the hell it is, right? <laughs> European ones are the worst. And I was always trying to be congenial and, like, responsive yeah. because, you know, any any journalist trying to get info out of me, I'm like, well, you're doing me a favor, so let me try and help you. But then that doesn't serve you well in that environment because if you're nice to one, then all of a sudden, like, ten mics will, like, get jammed in your face and, like, each one will throw a different question at you to try and get, like, a 30-second response that's exclusive to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good good, good ho- times. It was, it was like a feeding frenzy. Yeah. And the hardest part was always the timing to me because, like, Basically, if you're Fox, you've got your panel going on. You're like, all right, and you're talking. It's on like, all right, we're going to go live with Amy Klobuchar right now. And they got Amy, right? And so that's like a timing and a cadence. And in order to get in on that timing and cadence, you have to have good relationships with all the bookers and show producers and reporters within there. So when we were first starting, we didn't know anybody. Um, We had people we hired who kind of knew people. Um, So we're like, hey, do you want Andrew Yang? They're like, yeah, but after Kamala or like whatever the hell. And we were just like sometimes standing there awkwardly. It's like, so, oh, I hated it. I hated it. Um, <laughs> I hated it so much. You know, much. One, one, one debate, eh? uh, Evelyn came with me. That was fun. And Evelyn's like, this, I mean, yeah, she was like, this is a disaster. <laughs> like, what is happening? Like, I don't know. The real human at- reaction to that shark pit is pretty crazy. Uh, that's enough debate stuff. Let's move on. We've got Christian P- Picciolini. I do that right? Christian yeah, Picciolini. Picciolini. Yeah, who's who's a really fascinating guy. And Andrew, you knew him, I think, before you ever ran, right? I connected with him very early in my run because okay. of my uh, my book, The War on Normal People. I've been deeply concerned about uh, the marginalization of many uh, people from our economy, but also from American life. And in some cases, that leads to radicalization. And that radicalization has been facilitated greatly by the internet uh where today if you have any set of ideas you might be able to develop a following um from those ideas uh on some forum somewhere reddit 4chan 8chan uh you know wherever and a lot of those forums are perfectly benign but then some of them are the opposite of benign um and, and so I, i've been fixated on what we can do about these uh radicalized individuals and communities, many of which uh, adhere to very hateful uh, racist theologies. Mm -hmm. And Christian Picciolini to me is a singular figure in that he lived it. He Mm -hmm. led a white supremacist gang for the better part of a decade. Uh, And then he came out and now he relates his own experience, both in the movement, as he calls it, but then afterwards trying to help dozens, even hundreds of people de-radicalize and re-enter American life. And if you see what's going on right now in America, this is going to become more and more important. Uh, and uh, I learned from Christian. I quoted him on the debate stage once. I don't know if you remember this, Zach, where they yep. asked me uh, about, about this issue. Um, and uh, he's written two incredible books that I know of. Uh, uh, and I thought talking to him was very important in this moment because a lot of what we're talking about with the um, potential rancor and unrest around this election is tied into these communities, uh, these ideologies. A- and the temptation for a lot of people is just to um, say, well, you know, these people are uh, deeply wrong, immoral, damaged, and have to be uh, condemned and cast away. Yeah cast away and uh, expunged um, to the fullest extent possible uh, by any of our media platforms, social media platforms. And I understand why people feel that way. I do think that we need to do more, certainly on the social media front, to make it difficult um, for people to spread hateful ideas and ideologies. Um, But uh, I think Christian's approach is much more um, human, uh, experience-driven, nuanced uh and we should be putting massive levels of resources towards it um because the the way of a problem is not uh to deny its existence or to mm-hmm. um or, or to just say to everyone like let's condemn it um i mean sometimes condemnation is called for and it's good uh you know particularly from people in positions of prominence uh but 
that that will not solve most problems really especially when you're looking at a problem that has been festering because of frayed social connections uh and frayed and disintegrating paths forward in many many communities particularly among um young men uh yeah. who tend to be more prone to some of these um these ideologies so uh, learn a lot from christian i hope people enjoy uh learning from him as well i think he's a very very important leader uh, and most importantly, like a uh, human who's been through some things that really lead us in a better direction. It's one of the things I really love about you, Andrew, and always love working with you. You're, you're a lot better at this than I am where I think that, that you, you just said this, like the tendency when you hear these racial racist thoughts or these these Nazi groups or these really, really dark places. A lot of people are like, get rid of them. Screw you. Go away. Throw them on the rug. And you say that, but then you're like. That's also not helpful, right? Where there's, especially when these thoughts are, are growing that Christian talks about, these groups are, are growing in, in numbers or popularity in some some areas of the country right now. There's a reason for that. And there's a human element to figuring out why and how you can help people from joining. And that's where your head goes really naturally. And not a lot of people do. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? And, and you've kind of always done that. I'm like an and person. It's like, yes, mm -hmm. say that it's wrong. And like, what are the other facets of this problem that we can do something about? Yeah, that's a good improv for you, man. Yes, and. But um, look, look, this is an, a fascinating episode. It's like in the weeds on a world that no one really gets to see um, in a good way, in a helpful, human, positive, um, beneficial way. So Christian Picciolini joining Yang Speaks. Tune in, guys. You know what Yang speaks, we're serious about our data is our property. We should have control over it. We should know what happens to it. Now, while we're waiting for Congress to get its act together, what can we do to actually protect our data? ExpressVPN is the software that I and thousands of listeners use every day to protect our data online. I've been talking about ExpressVPN on my show for so long now that most of you already signed up. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but if, if you have it, why should you? Uh, it's like a button where it'll beam you to another part of the internet, and then whatever you do, no one knows what you did. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, and that's why corporations use it, so they can have their employees do things and not have it be monitored by the internet service provider or anyone else or the big tech companies or the data brokers. So if that sounds appealing to you, you should definitely check out ExpressVPN because they are top rated by CNET, Wired, and a lot of other folks who just look at virtual private networks all day and say, which one of you should I recommend? And they settled on ExpressVPN. So my question is, why haven't you gotten ExpressVPN yet? Our link, expressvpn.com slash yang, will give you an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Protect your data today with a VPN I trust to keep my data safe. Go to expressvpn.com slash yang to get started. One of the things about these VPNs out there that is not ExpressVPN, like some of the cheap knockoffs, is that they actually sell your data. So that's how they make their money. And one of the reasons we actually looked into the VPN options, why we love ExpressVPN. They, they don't do that. So they're actually aligned with <laughs> what we stand for at Humanity Forward and, and, and Andrew Yang's presidential run. So check this out, guys. Protect yourself with VPN that we use and trust. So use our link, expressvpn.com slash Yang today. Get an extra three months free on a one-year package. It is my pleasure to welcome to Yang Speaks, uh, the founder of Free Radicals, the author of several great books uh, on confronting extremism, particularly white supremacy. His latest book, Breaking Hate, is a book I'm a huge fan of. Christian Picciolini. Hey, Andrew. How are you? It's good to talk to you again. Hey, it's good to talk to you again, too. Uh, you're someone that I cited on the campaign trail, um, including during one of the debates because of your incredible background, um, where you spent almost 10 years deep in the white nationalist movement. You're the head of a, like a gang. Uh, you fronted one of the early, well, maybe not early, but like one of the most significant uh 
white supremacist rock bands um, where you performed internationally, even in Europe at like a show for thousands. Um, and you and I connected on the campaign trail because you have taken your experiences and use them to try and get people out of those movements today. Yeah, thank you very much. And I have to tell you, I think I was sitting in, in like a hotel room in Minneapolis when I was watching the debate. And it, when you mentioned my name, it took a second or two for it to register. And then I jumped up screaming because you pronounced my name correctly. So thank you for that. That was that was a really awesome moment. I appreciate that. After I said your name on the debate, stage uh did you get a bunch of text messages like yo i think this dude just said your name <laughs> i i did i did i think my wife was the was the first one she was back home in chicago and and then I, it just kind of the phone lit up after that but yeah no it's been a while and, and i really appreciate that you know and and i appreciate it too because it really has brought uh, a lot of exposure to the work that i do with free radicals project and a lot of people have reached out to me to try and get help disengaging from extremism because of that mention so thank you for that you really kind of brought some exposure to you know for help that people didn't know existed well thank you for actually providing the help and using your experience to help shed some light on a problem that many many americans care deeply about um, but are casting about for real solutions yeah you're one of the very very few people on earth in my opinion that has been doing this work and can offer real solutions uh, to help people combat hatred and extremism. So yeah. would love to talk to about, and you know, I talked about this even on the debate stage where you were radicalized when you were very young. Uh, and yeah. I think your story is indicative, but let's assume that the folks listening to this, uh, this is their first time ever hearing about Christian and your story. So can you walk us through um, how you wound up leading a, a white nationalist group? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I uh, I was uh, 14 years old in 1987 when I was recruited into America's first neo-Nazi skinhead gang uh, on the south side of Chicago. Um, and I spent eight years of my life until I was almost 23 years old uh, as a member of that gang, um, but also eventually a leader within that gang and then somebody who did travel overseas and was, you know, kind of very early in the youth part of the white supremacist movement in America, uh, kind of the the 1.0 version of what we're seeing today or what we saw in Charlottesville, uh, frankly. But, you know, it's really important to mention before that, Andrew, I, you know, before I was 14 and, and was standing in, in an alley smoking a joint and this guy came up to me, you know, pulled a joint out of my mouth, looked me in the eyes and said, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile. Because that's how I was recruited, literally standing in an alley. Um, and, you know, I didn't know what the hell a communist was. I didn't know what a Jew was. I didn't know what the word docile meant at 14 years old. Uh, but it was the first time in my life that I felt as though somebody had paid attention to me because before I was, you know, recruited that day, I came from kind of a normal family. Uh, my parents are Italian immigrants who came to the U.S. in the mid 60s, uh, and they were really working almost, you know, 18 hours a day, seven days a week to survive. So, you know, not only was I not raised around hate and I was raised by an immigrant family, uh, but I was also surrounded by a lot of love because I had grandparents and aunts and uncles who took care of me when my parents weren't there. I had a, a brother who was 10 years younger than me, uh, but um, on July 3rd, uh, when he was 20 years old, he was murdered uh, in, a, in a gang shooting unfortunately. So I went most of my life kind of as an only child. But before that, like I was surrounded by a lot of love. Like it wasn't, I wasn't raised in a hateful environment. My parents weren't racist. They had friends from all over the world. Um, but what I was looking for really was a family. Like I, I felt abandoned by my parents, even though I knew they loved me, they just weren't around and I wasn't mature enough to ask. So I went looking for a family. Uh, and that guy in that alley when I was 14 years old, offered that to me. He offered me a sense of identity. He offered me a community and he offered me a purpose, all three of which I was searching desperately for and couldn't find anywhere. Um, you and I are now like, you know, grown men and, and whatnot. Um, I'm trying to imagine 14 year old you like I, I, I can see in you that, you know, eventually you became uh, literally like a hate rock singer. So like, you know, yeah. you, you probably cast a particular profile. Um, when I was 14, as an example, you know, like I, I was skinny and awkward and like, you know, no one's, I'm just wondering like whether, um, 
there was anything about you at that time that screamed like, Hey, come radicalize me. Like, you know, I, I'd imagine not, I'd imagine you were, uh, you know, fairly nondescript. No, I was pretty invisible at 14 years old. I was, uh, you know, kind of, so, I mean, my dilemma was I was raised on the Southwest side of Chicago, um, in an Italian neighborhood. Uh, but my parents had moved me when I was born to, you know, kind of an affluent white neighborhood to go to school there, but I never spent any time, you know, after school. So I never made any friends there and I never made any friends in the Italian neighborhood because they saw me as an outsider too. So I just didn't, I was invisible. Um, and, uh, but I was also ambitious. My parents were entrepreneurs. They had started a small business and my grandparents had a small, I mean, it's like, that's all I knew. So I almost saw this as an opportunity for entrepreneurship at 14 years old. I went out on my own to try and make it on my own uh, and took, you know, was led down the wrong path for sure. So your parents must have been shocked when at some point you come back mm -hmm. and you're like, hey, you shave your head. You, you're like, hey, I'm a skinhead now. And like, I'm living with these people and working with these people. And, you know, like yeah. you, you forewent uh, college for like quite some time, obviously, to be uh, yeah. doing the work you were doing. They were horrified. Uh, the minute they figured out what I was involved in, they were, you know, horrified and they tried everything that they could to, to get me out. But at that point, I was already using it as a weapon against them. Um, you know, I, I started to, you know, denigrate immigrants because they were immigrants. I started to really kind of amplify everything that I knew was getting at them because I was pissed off that they, you know, had abandoned me, or at least that's what I thought back then. I don't think that now, uh, but that's what I thought at 14 and at 15 and at 18, I felt like I needed to punish them for leaving me. So I amplified everything that they hated. Um, because, you know, what teenager rebels against their parents by, you know, upholding their values? I did everything that they hated. Um, and uh, it pulled me deeper into the movement because of that. But I also definitely started to believe what I was getting into and, and then used it as a weapon against them. It was awful. And I feel ashamed for that. And I've, you know, I should say I've connected with my parents. We have a great relationship. Um, but it was a really rough, you know, eight years that I was involved. I think this is a really important um, idea or phenomenon because you weren't, I'm sure, the only 14-year-old kid who feels uh, angry. I mean, I, I was very angry at 14. Uh, and that anger plays out in different ways, you know, like for different people. And the fact that you might embrace something simply because it's kind of a reaction um, mm -hmm. to something else, I think it is... Uh, dynamic that's really powerful it's like playing out in various like how do you rebel like you said it's like well i'm immigrant parents and i'm pissed off at them then like you know maybe this ideology is something that uh can be used to hurt them yeah. i'm thinking about what i was angry about when i was 14 and i was quite angry um you know i think that uh that there are i think that there are certain periods in our lives where it's almost uh, unavoidable to, to be trying to find some sense of belonging. Um, yeah. and for me, I will speak for myself. I was one of the only, uh, non-white kids in my town. Um, and so there was like a sense of like alienation that, that came with that. Yeah. Um, in my case, like my anger manifests itself in me eventually, uh, taking up martial arts and working out a little bit too much and like, uh, you know, dressing like a skater and right. pretty harmless shit, <laughs> yeah. this, like, you know, re re like relatively speaking. Um, but there are different versions of it, different forms of rebellion. Um, certainly, I think uh, often uh, experimenting with drugs can be part of it. Like there, there are different behaviors you can take on. Yeah. I mean, I think part of me was also looking, screaming for attention, you know, from my parents. And then when I got it and I, I recognized what kind of power that wielded, I used it against them, um, you know, kind of, you know, as punishment almost for what, for what they had done to me. I wasn't, you know, I didn't know how to deal with it maturely. And, and, uh, I got involved in some stuff that I ended up believing. And then I not only used it against them, but I used it against a lot of people. Um, you know, I made music that, that still, despite my attempts to try and have it removed, lives on in the internet. You know, um, I put ideas out into the world that, you know, I take full accountability for. And I still, 20 years after, you know, 20 plus years after I've left, um, have held myself accountable for. Um, I planted a lot of seeds. It's one reason why you're such an important and compelling figure to me, Christian, because you have folks who look at the, these ideas uh, and... In your case, it's like, look, I, I held some very noxious, terrible uh, 
hateful ideas at a certain point, but then eventually I realized that they were wrong and now I'm trying to help mm-hmm. others in, in the same direction. So I, I feel like you are in, in many ways like a living um, like map as to mm-hmm. how these transformations can take place and be reversed uh, which is to me so important because again, so many Americans are casting about for real solutions. So tell us more about it. your uh, eight or nine years uh, as part of the movement. Um, you literally ended up a leader of one of like the biggest um, gangs in Illinois. It sounded yeah. like uh, after the leader that preceded you was jailed, I believe. Yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, to be clear, it was, there was nothing that anybody who I thought I hated ever did. There was nothing that they ever did to me to make me hate them. Uh, It was me hating myself and really projecting that self-hatred onto other people. And I think that's the case for anybody involved in these movements, because certainly, you know, nobody else is is to blame for their hatred. Um, You know, during those eight years, um, it was it started out with just kind of a fascination with the camaraderie, you know, the music and the fashion of it kind of brought us together. It developed a really clear sense of identity. So at first it was pretty benign. You know, I just felt like it was a group of guys. I was 14. I didn't you know, I wasn't very politically minded or anything like that. It took me a while to learn that stuff. But very quickly, by the time I was 16, the guy who had recruited me in that alley, Clark Martell, uh, and I should say, too, this was the Chicago area skinheads was the very first neo-Nazi skinhead gang in America. So it was already kind of this infamous group. And the guy who had recruited me was this really infamous skinhead leader. He was the first uh, kind of white power skinhead leader. Uh, and he had gone to jail at 16, when I was 16 years old. And he was, he was several years older than me, like 10 years older than me. Uh, and several other people had gone to jail for a really brutal uh, hate crime um, involving another uh, young girl who was a skinhead, but had been seen with a black man and they had gone to her apartment and and pistol whipped her. And and it was a really awful situation, but he had gone to prison and so had everybody else that was part of this small group or they were running away from the law. And here I was like this barely 16 year old kid who wasn't involved in that because I was too young to have been brought out to something like that. And I was essentially the last man standing. Uh, So everybody else was gone. And here I was this, you know, 16 year old kid who now was the only one left in this very famous infamous gang. And I took it over and I started to recruit people that were younger than me. I started to recruit, you know, my peers. Some people kind of came back over time. And suddenly I, you know, I'd gone from this invisible 14 year old to this, you know, 16 and 17 year old who had this tremendous amount of and I'm putting up air quotes for those who are just listening, respect. I didn't have respect, uh, but that's what it felt like. And that really intoxicated me. And I started to get more involved in kind of paving the way for new things within that movement, like making music. I was in the first American band of that genre to leave and travel overseas and, and perform. Um, so I spread it around, unfortunately. Uh, the, the name of the band was uh, W.A.Y., White American Youth, I believe. Yeah, I had two bands, unfortunately, and the and the name of the other one was actually worse. It was Final Solution. That's the band that performed in Germany illegally, I should say. So you are uh, the last man standing at the age of 16, 17. Uh, was there like a physical clubhouse or environment? Like, how, mm-hmm. like where did convenings take place? How were you living at this point? Were you still living with your family? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, there was really no formal structure. It was, you know, kind of a gang. We convened in people's basements and backyards and parking lots. Um, I w- had moved out kind of at 15 and a half or so uh, and commandeered my, you know, the basement of, of my parents, um, you know, multi-unit flat and uh, kind of turned it into an apartment with a separate entrance and everything. So I was living on my own at a fairly early age against my parents' wishes, even though it was still under technically under their roof. Uh, so we did a lot of things there. We had held a lot of meetings there. Um, it was it operated a lot like a gang might. We intimidated people. Um, you know, we got in fights. It was physical. Uh, we spread propaganda. Um, you know, this was all pre-internet, so we didn't have, you know, that kind of platform. So it was very face to face. We would stand outside of, you know, arcades and punk rock shows with flyers and and try to recruit, you know, other vulnerable looking kids. Oh, we'll we'll certainly talk about the internet, um, uh, a little bit later on because, you know, that, that has been such an accelerant to a lot of these ideologies and problems. (laughs) 
one of the toughest things during this pandemic is feeling good about yourself physically. A lot of it has to do with what you're putting in your body. We're all about trying to promote people's healthy diets here at Yang Speaks. And one thing that's done the trick for me and a lot of other people is athletic greens. I love it because you can just do it every day. It's super easy. It's super convenient. You just mix it together, add water, you drink it, and you feel like you've just had uh, a whole lot of nutrients and minerals that your body has been missing because they're not in Cheetos or whatever the heck you're eating. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So if that sounds like something that would benefit you, definitely check it out. They've invested a ton of energy and resources into figuring out how to support your immune system, keep you healthy, give you nutrients in a way that your body really likes it. In COVID right now, I'm doing everything I can to, to stay positive and happy. And one of the ways I do that is through food. Yet if I eat like cheese or grease or stuff like that, I it never it's not necessarily a good thing now that I'm 32, my body's falling apart. So I love athletic greens because it actually helps my gut. It actually helps me digest. So I, I just re-upped my stash of this stuff. I love it. You put it, it's like a quick packet or a scoop. You throw it in some water, mix it up, tastes fine or really good, uh, depending if you, if you like this stuff, which I do. Um, and you, you can, I feel better when I eat frankly like crap because I got my nutrition I got my multivitamins and I got my like immune system balanced um, from athletic greens. So I'm a big fan of this product. So if you want to invest in your health and your gut health today, go to athleticgreens.com slash yang. You'll receive up to a year's supply of liquid vitamin D for free. That's like liquid sunshine with your first purchase. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash yang to get some green in your life you know you need some green and you're looking around your kitchen being like there's nothing green in here (laughs) so you uh become a musician uh you have like an international trip um you have this arc that spans years how did when was the first time you started realizing wait a minute like I, i'm not sure how fully i believe these things or that this is wrong or that there is something uh very dark and hateful that i, I may not want to continue to lead what was there a particular moment or revelation or relationship I, I think i had doubts from the time i was 14 years old and that guy came up to me in that alley every day until the day I left eight years later. Um, but, you know, there certainly were some moments that were kind of like trajectory changers, absolutely. Um, at 19 years old, I got married uh, to, you know, another girl, a girl who was 19 years old. We had a child and then two years later we had another child. So by the time I was 21, I had two kids and I was a dad and a, and a husband. That helped change me because my wife wasn't involved in the movement. And when I was home, I didn't want to introduce my family to that. She knew uh, and she, you know, begrudgingly, you know, went along with it. Um, but I also was a different person at home. Uh, so I had kind of a replacement identity, community, and purpose. Uh, and that was a, a massive help. Um, also around 1995, just before I left the movement, um, at, because I was trying to compromise with my wife at the time, she didn't want me on the streets, I decided uh, to open a record shop um, so to try and make myself more legitimate. Uh, but I was selling racist music that I was importing, music that I was making. Uh, and um, But I was also selling hip hop and punk rock and, and you know black metal and stuff like that. It was called Chaos Records. Uh, so it was it was pretty evident that we were intent on causing chaos. Um, but the people I met there, they knew who who I was. They knew what I was selling, and they were you know customers who were uh, black or brown or Jewish or gay, and they treated me like a human being. And and although it wasn't their responsibility to do that, and and uh, uh, I'm very grateful that they did, though they you know they. They didn't have to do that. Um, that helped change me. I received compassion from people I didn't even deserve it from, and that was super powerful. You know, it was 75% of my revenue. It was pre-internet, so people were coming in from all over the country, from Canada, to buy it. I was one of the only stores in America that was selling that kind of music. So, um, 75% of your record store revenue was from the um, white power... Racist music. Like, racist music? Wow, yeah. because and I thought was, to myself that that you had like a fairly normal record store, and then there were like some some people who were getting the this stuff like on the yeah. you know the fly on the side. But it sounds like that was most of the revenue. That's insane. 
Well, it was probably only 10% of my inventory. I didn't even keep it out in the, you know, in the shelves. I kept all the regular stuff out in the shelves, but still the, the racist music was 75% of my revenue, even though it was only 10% of my inventory. Uh, yeah. So that was the business then. I mean, clearly it's not like a, it's a normal record store with like a, you know, like a sideline. I mean, it was like right. essentially a hate music store. No, it was. It was a hate music store. But then when I pulled that, because I became embarrassed to sell it because of these new people I was becoming friendly with, uh, I pulled that music. And of course, I had to close the store because I couldn't even keep the doors open anymore. Yeah. So that that might have been the big decision then when you like if you make the decision to to snuff out your business. I mean, you have to know that's happening. Um, My wife also left me. (laughs) She left me at that same time. Um, I hit rock bottom is what happened. I closed the store. My wife left me, took the kids. um, And I used that opportunity in a very sneaky and cowardly way to walk away from the movement. I didn't denounce it. Uh, I didn't tell, you know, I told my buddies, I'll be back. I just need to go work on my life. Be back in a few months. I was never planning on going back. Uh, It took me about five years before I kind of denounced it and, and faced my past head on. I, di- I didn't really start doing that until, you know, 1999 or 2000 because I was running from, I was really trying to run from who I was as fast as I could um, until I realized it was killing me to do that. So in your case, uh, you went to college, I want to say. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Um, I left the movement in 96. took me a couple of years to really figure out who I was. I got kind of depressed. And then in 99, um, a friend of mine, uh, one of the few friends I had at the time, uh, encouraged me to go apply for a job at IBM. And I thought she was crazy. You know, here I was the sex skinhead full of tattoos. I hadn't, I'd been kicked out of like six high schools, one of them twice. Uh, I didn't go to college. I didn't even own a computer at the time, Andrew. And she's like, yeah, go apply at IBM. It's a, you know, a new position that they offered. I'm like, okay, sure. And I went in and it was an entry level position. Uh, it was uh, setting up um, and uh, kind of re- uh, re-imaging all the computers that like a corporation would uh, buy at once. So it'd be like 400 computers and we'd spend a month, you know, setting that up. And my first job was to install all the hundreds of computers at my old high school, the one I'd gotten kicked out of twice. And they offered me the job and I took it. It was super entry level. Uh, and I was terrified because even though they had no idea about my past, the first day of my first you know, my job out of the movement was to go set up the computers at my old high school. And I thought I was going to get fired and they'd you know, destroy my life. Um, and I went. I was terrified. And... Uh, if, you know, moral of the story, IBM eventually sent me to, to go to college. But moral of the story was I met the man there that day on my first day of work, who was the old security guard at my old high school, black man who I whose life I had made hell. And he was the one who changed my trajectory. He's the one who, you know, I didn't know what to say to him when I came across him in the hallway. I said, I'm sorry. Uh, his name's John Holmes. I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes. And he looked at me kind of scared because I had made his life hell when I had gone to that school. And he said, you know, sorry makes you feel good. It doesn't do a whole lot for me. Uh, So I think, you know, you need to repair the damage you've done. And he embraced me. This was a man I'd hurt, a black guy who, you know, in my heyday was I made his life hell. Uh, And he embraced me and he said, I, you know, I believe in you and, and I think you need to tell your story. And that was in 1999. Uh, and I started uh, telling my story in roughly January of 2000, 20 years ago. Changed my life. He saved my life. I don't know that I would have made it without him. Well, that's extraordinarily compassionate of him. You know, like we all like to hope that we might react similarly to someone who tormented us. But yeah. um, most of us don't have that in us, I don't think. Um, so you're at IBM at this role. And then they say, you know what? You could use some some studies. And so they ended up. Um, helping you go to DePaul. Is that right? Yeah. So I started out at this just like computer installer and then I worked my way up to uh, an assistant researcher or assistant project manager. And then I became an assistant researcher and then uh, I got hired onto IBM full time, uh, started to lead a, a team in their SMB and their small medium business division when the internet was just picking up steam. Uh, and uh, through the work that I had done had started like over 12 quarters um, like uh, had developed leads that were like a quarter of a billion dollars. So at, at that point, IBM was was very happy with with my work. I had uh, developed kind of this pioneering research team there uh, in the sales department. So they were like, yeah, you know, we should really, you need a degree. And I was like, yeah, I would agree with that. So I went and I got my degree as an adult uh, in international relations and international business. Uh, and uh, I spent 
almost, I think, seven years or almost eight years at IBM. Uh, and I got my degree from DePaul during that time, too. And I'm really grateful for that. Wow. What an arc that <laughs> must have been. So that takes you through a particular period. And are, are you in touch with your um, ex-wife and kids at, at that time? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I never lost touch with with my ex wife and my kids. You know, it was difficult with my ex wife when we went through the divorce, but I I always wanted to be a good dad, so I always always had the kids every weekend. You know, Friday to Monday as they were growing up, so I never lost that connection with them. And in fact, they're twenty eight and twenty six years old. They're not little boys anymore, uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, they're doing great, and uh, they saved my life too. I mean, it hadn't been for them to really challenge me. Uh, and for me to have to be honest with them about who I was, um, you know, I don't know that I would have made it this far. So then in 2000, you start telling your story. You're still working for IBM. Um, how did that transition look? You no, know, eventually you wound up writing these books, uh, starting these organizations, working in media, yeah. um, trying to get the word out. Um, what Was that a, a big step? I'm sure the first time you started telling people openly about your past, that must have been very, very difficult. Yeah. I, I mean, it really took, I, I told very, very few people like from 2000 to 2003, it was, you know, I started to talk to family and people that I knew my wife who I'm, you know, been married to now for, for, you know, 15 years have known for almost 18 or 19 years, um, who also worked at IBM at the time. It wasn't until 2003 when I went to DePaul that I really started to tell my story. And then, uh, in 2004, when my brother was murdered, uh, that's when I really started to do the work that I'm doing now, when I started to focus on trying to help people disengage from hate groups, because I, I realized at that point that I hadn't that I could have been a better big brother to him uh, and that now I could probably try and, and do that with other people that I didn't know that also needed kind of a, you know, a guiding voice, so to speak. Well, we're certainly glad that you did. And uh, you ended up writing a memoir um, that, that was published, uh, in multiple countries, uh, and have become, uh, an incredible figure. Thank you. Okay. I know how it is. You've been listening to a lot of stuff lately, including this podcast. Thank you. And you have wired earbuds and you're like, Maybe I should spring for wireless earbuds, but you're afraid you're going to lose them. You're afraid they're too expensive. Now, if that describes you, you should definitely check out the new wireless earbuds from Raycon. I got to say, the newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, they're best ones yet. Six hours of playtime, more bass, more compact design. You can listen to your own music and no one else can hear it. They can't even tell you have earbuds in. They stay in your ears and are comfortable. Uh, they look great, but they're invisible. So them looking great is actually not that big a deal. <laughs> if this sounds like something you want to check out and you can feel smart about it because it's really the same value for a lot less money. All right, honestly, I like these things because I like bumping the bass, particularly on the subway or just riding. I ride the, I ride a scooter around New York city. So I like bumping the bass. So I don't have to listen to people or frankly, talk to people, particularly in COVID. So I think Raycon's earbuds have really, really strong audio quality, which I love. Celebrities think they're cool too. Uh, so whether it's Snoop Dogg or even J.R. Smith, who just won a title and is not wearing a shirt ever um, right now, these guys use them. They endorse the product. The people who like music or like what's stylish are big fans of this. So for a limited time, get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash yang. That's buyraycon.com dot com slash yang for a special 15 percent discount on raycon wireless earbuds make sure to check it out now while this deal is running by raycon.com slash yang what is your approach to people who are still radicalized and are struggling um yeah. because you have at this point de-radicalized how many people would you say I mean, it's, it's impossible to put a number on it, but I've worked with over 600 people at various stages of their disengagement, you know, from people just for support because they got out on their own to people who are actively, you know, still in and, and working their way out. So, you know, anywhere over 600 people, I think now. Um, I mean, that, that's yeah. a lot of lives to have touched. And, and thank you. Uh, there's a lot of heart and soul that goes into each one because you, you have to kind of live through your own uh 
dark moments of the soul in order to be able to relate to folks who are are struggling in that way. Uh, that's really important. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up. And that's really important. You know, I've learned a lot of about secondary trauma uh, in doing the work that I've been doing and, and the idea of when you are surrounded by other people's trauma and you're constantly dealing with their trauma and sifting through and helping them work through it, that it actually causes you trauma. And, you know, on top of the the PTSD that I still struggle with from, from those years having been involved, but also having caused other people trauma. Uh, and that, you know, if anybody's listening and they're going through that and they're in kind of the field of dealing with other people, be really cognizant of your own trauma that might be building because of that you know call it compassion fatigue call it you know secondary trauma but be very cognizant of that i've had to figure that out and i've had to do self-care for that uh when i've noticed it so i'm really glad that you brought that up because that's very important now we i've seen versions of it um myself in different ways uh, certainly not to the same degree that you you experience um you know one one story i'll share that uh, is personal is that when my my wife Evelyn came out with her story of mm. um, being sexually assaulted and then we were on the trail and she would uh, talk to dozens of women who thanked her but would also often um, be carrying with them like a, a similar experience and uh, Evelyn uh, would be helping them process through their um, pain and um, anger and, and different things um, and I would see Evelyn after she would talk to this group of people and see that obviously she was um, very happy and grateful, but also it took a lot out of uh, her, just like it would take a lot out of anyone. Um, and, and so for you, I can see very clearly it would be, it's not an easy thing, like, you know, to have talked to 600 people that have been through a version of your journey. And then you you have to kind of um, re-engage uh, with like uh, this this whole uh arc that you went through um mm -hmm. if you're going to be able to help someone else yeah. uh so it it takes a lot uh, it's one reason why i think you are so important and that there and that there aren't um more people i mean i'm sure there are some there are other people that have gone through versions of your journey yeah. um and so if, if i am someone who's struggling uh with trying to disengage from one of these uh movements or organizations uh, like, what is your approach to yeah. that person? Yeah, and my new book, Breaking Hate, outlines the co the complete process that I use in helping people disengage, and also uses stories that of people that I've worked with. Um, but it really it kind of boils down to we have to understand the motivations of why people are led to these movements. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's never, it's typically never the ideology that they're after, right? The ideology is not attractive. It's illogical. It's irrational uh, to hate somebody based on the color of their skin. I mean, it's based on conspiracy theories and, and garbage. Uh, so it's not the ideology. So we have to understand um, as people are on this search for identity, community and purpose, which we all are at some point in our lives, sometimes multiple times in our lives, uh, we hit what I call potholes in our life's journey. And potholes are things like physical trauma and abuse, uh, could be uh, mental illness, it could be job loss, it could be grief, it could be poverty, it can also be privilege, if privilege keeps us too separate from humanity. It could be millions of different things. It could be you know getting divorced and never really kind of dealing with that. Uh, and those potholes lead us to the fringes, they detour us. And on the fringes, there are all sorts of narratives to try and comfort us, to try and uh, kind of take advantage of our vulnerability. Uh, things like, you know, sex traffickers are waiting there and gangs are waiting there and, and, you know, drug culture is waiting there. But white supremacists are waiting there, too, to to try and attract people with a narrative that takes their pain and projects it on to somebody else. So my goal when I work with people is really to listen uh, very closely to those potholes and then try and repair them as best as I can. Because once the potholes are repaired, we can work on replacing the toxic identity, community and purpose that they've found, that they're getting a reward from uh, with something that's more positive. Um, and um, that's the process that I use with everybody. You know, I don't do it myself. I find people to help. I find therapists and um, you know, psychologists and job trainers and life coaches to help that person. Uh, but it really is all about kind of repairing their foundation to bring them back on the path to find something more positive. And what are the positive things? And you and I have talked about this. Um, so first, I think the notion of potholes is 
so important because I feel like at this point, potholes are almost more commonplace than smooth road yeah. uh, in American life. Uh, you know, I mean, especially now with this pandemic where there are so many people who were uh, working very hard um, and trying to get uh, ahead or stay afloat. And then now they've gotten the legs kicked out from under them and they're looking around saying, what the heck? You know, I, yeah. I, 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 I was uh, doing my best as, as I could as a trucker, bartender, airline attendant, hairstylist, personal trainer, like, you, you know, you name it, yeah. uh, like all, all these servers, like all these jobs that um, have gotten decimated as a result of the pandemic. Um, so I, I feel like potholes are now like the new normal um, yeah. in American life. Uh, and uh, I feel societies can also have, a, you know, massive potholes. American society, like people, you know, is on a really broken search for its identity, community and purpose right now. America has its historical potholes that we've never addressed, that we've never fixed. Things like slavery and inequity and, and you know, how people have been held back. Uh, so until we fix that, you know, America is also in is prime for radicalization right now. And I mentioned earlier that it could happen at different stages. I'm also noticing with people who are newly retired. So people in their 60s now are becoming radicalized because like young people at 14, well, they're making new friends because they're retired. They don't have their old career anymore. Sometimes they've moved to a new city or a new state to retire, and they're starting over with a new identity, a new community and purpose. And they have access to the Internet, which is, you know, prime uh, platform and prime fodder for radicalization. So I really am very, very concerned. Like you mentioned, all these layers, pandemic, unemployment, an election that's coming up, um, you know, job loss. It's it is a perfect storm for for us to become radicalized right now. And it scares the shit out of me. It scares me too, Christian. Uh, it's one reason why I think your experience is so important for us to get out there and to, to let people know uh, what we can do better. Um, so we'll come back to what we can do to build more positive pathways for people. Um, but I, I want to continue in what you just said about the internet. Um, yeah. So it, it's clear to most of us now that Social media is bad for our sense of togetherness and wellness. And we have alternative uh, facts and versions of reality that we're experiencing. Uh, the social media companies are profiting from that. Uh, it enhances division and it gives a foothold to really hateful, negative ideology. So I, I wanted to go through a very dark exercise and I apologize uh, if this is um, a, a difficult but I want you to imagine when you were at the, the height of your engagement in um, these uh, neo-Nazi uh, organizations and gangs, if you'd had mm. the Internet. Uh, mm. Because one thing that folks I think are catching on from even this conversation is that you're a very entrepreneurial person. Mm. Uh, you know, like it's very entrepreneurial to uh, start a rock band, to start a business, uh, to help um, folks de-radicalize now, your parents are entrepreneurs. I want mm. you to imagine if you'd had that entrepreneurial zeal and energy and the internet existed then the way it exists now, um, like how would you have used it? Wow, that's a really dangerous question. Uh, I don't want to give anybody any ideas out there. Um, but yeah, that's a really scary thought. You can fall short of actually giving people like, quote unquote like <laughs> okay, useful um, advice, but I was just trying to paint a picture as to um, the fact that right now the internet feels like it would be an incredibly uh, powerful accelerant uh, to being able absolutely. to spread hateful ideas. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I, you know, to one in one degree, I'm I'm so glad that the internet didn't exist when I was involved because I don't know that we'd be talking now, you know, if there was, you know, so much record like exists, you know, for people today, because it really is hard to forgive people, um, you know, once, once it's kind of immortalized and, you know, on the internet. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I probably would be using it a lot like it is being used now as a, as a platform for propaganda. I was a propagandist. I, I made music that was propaganda. Uh, but, you know, we did it in a very traditional way of pressing records, pressing CDs, you know, hustling, you know, out of backpacks to try and sell that stuff and eventually having a record store. Had the internet existed then, like it does now, you know, I can, I can see how music could have reached millions of people instead of thousands of people. And music could have been used as, as a, as a really, you know, powerful, uh, 
you know, propaganda tool. Um, but yeah, in many ways, like they're doing now to target vulnerable people with a message uh, that they can be glorious, that there is something better, that they can go, you know, to this greatness, kind of like make America great again, right? You're, you're promising the hope, hopeless hope. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, and I'm really glad the internet didn't exist back then, to be honest, but it's a problem now. Well, when you talk about the ability to forgive yourself um but then you were just saying hey we might not be having this conversation because the world would not have forgiven me if all of my activities had been uh immortalized in that way that's like a very profound statement that i think a lot of people can understand and relate to like if you have folks now who have done things on the internet and then now are trying to de-radicalize i almost feel like they might look up and be like well it's impossible for me to de-radicalize because people are going to attribute these uh, beliefs uh, and activities to me forever, like even if I try and repudiate them now, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I can't help but think that had I not started to talk about this publicly, you know, almost 20 years ago, and I'd be in a position now where that's who I was and, and nobody knew it, I would be terrified, I think, every day of somebody finding out, publishing, you know, my name and my old music. Like, I, I'm I I was forward thinking in the sense that I wanted to come clean, you know, almost 20 years ago. But had I not, I might be terrified. And I know that there are thousands of people out there who used to be part of that. uh, And maybe now are much, much better people have learned so much since they were, you know, younger and involved in that. And now are probably living every day like they're scared of being found out. And to them, I would say, just come clean. You know, I think if you're genuine and if you have, you know, sincerely done enough to repair the damage that you've caused, people will forgive you. I've seen that. I've received, you know, that forgiveness based on how I've held myself accountable. If you haven't, you know, done that work to repair the damage you've done, then start. Uh, because, you know, eventually, why live every day in fear? At least live, you know, with some kind of honor for yourself that you're fixing what you helped break. Um, but yeah, I get it. It's tough. It's a tough, you know, emotion, an emotional environment is really tough to, you know, to find redemption. in. so that's why I think I said what I did listening to this and thinking I, that is what I want for myself. Like, how do they reach out to you and your organization? Like where, where do they go? Uh, if they're, um, starting to explore what a path out might look like. Well, they can always uh, reach out to us at freeradicals.org. Uh, but there are also a lot of other people, uh, you know, other groups offering support these days. So they can just, you know, kind of Google help with disengaging from extremism. Uh, but, you know, I'm also really easy to find if you just kind of Google X skinhead. I'm typically the first person who pops up in Google search, too. Uh, this is going to be a random question, but can you take your cap off? I just want to see what your, your hair is looking like. <laughs> <laughs> karma, my friend. This is karma. You know, I shaved my head for so many years that the minute I decided I was going to stop shaving it, you know, the a higher power said, you know what, screw you. You're not going to get any more hair. <laughs> but you could like, uh, you know, I, I mean, I was just more <laughs> curious to joking than anything else. Um, but, you know, in that case, clearly, you know, you've like uh, the head of hair is that of many, many of um, uh, of men your age, yeah. um, our age, because, you know, you and I are about the same age. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. If I'm 40, I'll be 47 on, I'll be 47 on election day. November 3rd is my 47th birthday. Well, you may be getting a present, my friend. I I sure hope so. So one of the things you informed me of when I was running is that, look, we have to try and fill the potholes and then provide positive pathways for people. Yeah. Uh, And there are different. So you talked about these junctures when someone can become radicalized because they're missing that sense of purpose, community structure. Uh, yeah. I could not agree more like that. The goal to me should be to create, create as many uh, environments and organizations and situations where people feel that sense of purpose, community structure. Uh, it was very touching to me when you said to me months ago, where I said, look, um, if instead of that skinhead coming to me when I was 14, it had been a uh, coach or community leader in a positive way or a teacher, like, you know, I, I would have gone with that person too, you know, like, Absolutely. like the, this, that those touch points aren't there. So what can we do to provide more of these positive pathways and what can they look like? Wow. I mean, I think that there are lots of opportunities. I mean, I think to, to some degree, family and faith and, and, you know, school and all the things that we already, you know, have in, in, in our society can provide really positive pathways for that. But I also think, you know, we have to maybe rethink how, you know, 
we empower young people. I think we're failing young people. And I think you really understood that really, really well during the campaign, like, and understood how Americans are behind. You know, imagine a world where if for their senior, what if we brought back, um, uh, you know, uh, the idea of, uh, the draft, but it's not milit, I'm not talking about a military draft. What if senior year, our students were mandatorily supposed to go out into the world to work for civil society? They could volunteer for an, a nonprofit organization or an NGO. They could, you know, go understand what it, our government looks like they could become a page in the Senate or something like that. But their senior year is working out in the world with people that are different than the ones they grew up with and went to school with. Imagine if, if we paid, imagine if we paid them to do that, Andrew, we could give them college savings bonds. Like American exchange program, senior in high school, we send you someplace else to volunteer. Absolutely. And, and essentially it'd be like kid swap because yeah. if I've got a senior in high school, my kid's going to go someplace else. And like, sure. I'll like house some kid sure. from another um, state or, or whatnot or uh, community. And then just from that exposure, they would look up and say, wait a minute, like you, you tell me people are terrible in yeah. Illinois. It's like, I was there or our Facebook friends were there. Right. Uh, my my and, vision was that this exchange program, you go and there are like clusters right. of 25 of you from different communities. And then it's not just you interacting with the folks in that community. You're going to interact with 24 other seniors who are from all over the country. Absolutely. And pay them to do it. Give them, you know, half, half cash because they are working in the real world and give them savings bonds to use towards college. So then when they're done with that year, they have a head start on college. That kind of helps, you know, two things, the, the inability to pay for school. That is such a problem in, in our country, but also, you know, this this problem of polarization and not having the experience in the real world. And I think that that may be, you know, what we need to start preparing young people for is is, is let them lead. And, and let's put them in positions wh where we can empower them instead of prescribe what we think, you know, the solution is. Maybe that's where we're failing. We're failing young people on multiple levels, Christian. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we need to reinvest in our people. And like you said, empower and trust them uh, to help carve out uh, what their opportunities and livelihoods and businesses and organizations can and should look like. I'm a huge believer in entrepreneurship for this reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think something like the American Exchange Program would be immensely helpful. Uh, yeah. I think universal basic income would be immensely helpful because if you're a young person and you look up and uh, you are struggling with a path forward, um, right now there's like a sense that no one values you, no one believes in you, no one's willing to invest in you and so if we said to young people it's like hey guess what here's a thousand bucks like uh you mm -hmm. know the first month they'd be like this is too good to be true they like you know maybe do something <laughs> like yeah. um uh like somewhat uh you know fun loving with it or whatnot but then uh you know people can sense when you're investing in them people can sense when you're bullshitting them too uh, if, right. if you actually said look we love you we value you we care about you and here's an investment in you and your future it could be in the form of a bond for school it could be just economic resources, that's a game changer because most people right now don't feel like we uh, care about them, that we see them. Yeah, no, I hear you. And and that feeling of invisibility is really tough because some some people will go out of their way to amplify really bad things to, to be seen. And I think we're in this moment right now where it's just every, it's like a feedback loop where everybody's screaming louder and having to scream louder at each other until, you know, it's just one high pitched noise that, that none of us can bear. Uh, and I, I'm really, I'm really worried about our future because how, you know, we need to, we need steps to come back from this. And, uh, you know, I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, but I worry about our society in general and, and how, you know, how we come back from this. And I, and I really hope that there is a, a spot in the administration for you because I, I really think so many of your ideas were game changers. And I think a lot of people really saw that and, and bought onto that. Thank you, Christian. I think you're uh, a game changer yourself. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think we need to try and create an army or a multitude of you. Um, is, is that possible? Like, are there other people who've been in and then out of these hate groups that could uh, become uh, deconverters or de-radicalizers uh, in the same way that you are? Like, is it conceivable that we could build a whole force of Christian Picholini? <laughs> Perhaps less you know, uh, less cool, <laughs> better looking, I hope. I don't know. <laughs> or, you know, like less like, um, you know, I, I mean, there'd obviously be variations because, you know, people are, are all um, distinct and unique. 
Uh, but yeah. are there more people like you who'd want to do the same kind of work? Absolutely. There are already and they're already doing great work. We call our, you know, we call ourselves formers or somebody else made that name up and we kind of just adopted it. But there are formers out there who spent time in these movements, who've done the work to repair the damage they've done and are now doing this work. But I think even more than that, we already have the tools in our society to fix this. We have you know, psychologists and therapists and job trainers and life coaches and counselors and, and all, you know, all this stuff that we can utilize. They just don't know that they can do this work because it really is about the work of human resilience. So if we can just train them, if we can just make them aware that, hey, they never have to have an ideological debate. They never have to, you know, talk about ideology with people. It's really just about fixing their potholes. Then I think that's how we scale this immediately is just letting the people that exist out there who know how to do the work of building people back just let them know that they can do. And I've actually been working on curriculum to, to try and, and, you know, instruct some of these people. Uh, so you don't need a bunch of me. You, you, we just need to, to re-leverage the tools that exist already. I, I think we need them both personally. <laughs> um, well, when, when someone hears that too, they think, oh, you know, sure, we have psychologists and uh, life coaches and job trainers and social workers and everything else. Um, but it seems like the average person struggling with, hatred or membership in one of these organizations does not have access or resources yeah. um, for those services. Um, and I'm not going to ask you a personal question that's yeah. um, that I'm, I'm genuinely curious about. So you're a former, mm -hmm. like, uh, let's say there were a thousand people like you. Um, where d d would the funding come from right now? In my mind, this should clearly be something that the public would be funding to the nth degree where anyone who's like hey i'm a former hate group member who'd like to de-radicalize others are being like done <laughs> like <laughs> you know, whatever you need we should be supplying it to you and just freaking knocking down your door to like to help equip you i wish it were that easy man but i know that's not the way the world works like yeah. and, and and you know i'm i, I understand activism so yeah. uh first um, where do your resources come from? Um, because you obviously put a lot of time and energy and everything else into it. And two, like, where should we be getting the resources for this army of formers? Yeah. Uh, you know, ever since I've been doing this, I have self-funded this work. So I do a lot of speaking engagements. Last year in 2019, I was on the road 50% of the time, you know, like in six countries, 20 different uh, states. And I, a hundred percent of the funds that I use that I charge for my speaking gigs go to pay for the services and go to fund the organization. Other than that, we take donations at freeradicals.org. Uh, I've stopped asking the government for money uh, because the one time I did that, uh, you know, and we actually won a $400,000 grant with my old organization uh, under President Obama. The minute the administration changed and, and uh, President Trump was in uh, power, they rescinded that grant without ever having paid it. Um, and so I, I promised myself I was going to stop asking the government until the administration changed. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, you know, it's been a little bit of a struggle, to be honest, because of COVID. You know, I'm not speaking on the road as much. So um, I'm doing everything virtually and, and it's been a struggle. Um, but other countries do do it right there. You know, there's a group in Sweden uh, that's been doing this for you know over a decade, a group in Germany that's made up of formers and professional practitioners with government support. And they've been able to help hundreds and hundreds of people disengage. So it can be done. But with the current administration, with the current infrastructure, the only thing that they're doing is is increasing radicalization, to be honest. Uh, in the last four years, it has just it has been out of control and overwhelming. The amount of people that have been, you know, radicalized by careless rhetoric, uh, by you know, kind of both sidesism type talk, and, and you know, just the influx of, of propaganda that we've seen in the last four years online, it's been kind of a nightmare. Well, I'm personally going to make a donation to freeradicals.org uh, after uh, this conversation. I'd encourage others to do the same. What is the size of the opportunity set? Like if someone were to come, I think 400000 from the Obama administration, like, yeah. oh, well, that's good. And then the fact they never right. uh, had an opportunity to pay it because of the changeover, that's terrible. Uh, yeah. to, to me, this should be uh, a multi-million dollar uh, effort easily. I mean, heck, if I were in the White House and we were having this conversation, I'd be like, write this man a blank check because like and any money, we not even you individually, I mean, obviously the org, um, and, and it would be like, Hey, I want to come back and see like a thousand Christians, like doing this yeah. work. This is like, to me, uh, I, I, cause I, I want to say something that, you know, like it's, 
Um, we should not settle for denunciation. I mean, the fact that the president could not denounce white supremacy is awful and uh, obviously emboldened folks with, with hateful ideologies. But it, it is not enough to for us to come and say, like, look, this this is wrong. Like, mm -hmm. we have to be real about the fact that uh, this is happening and it's preying upon uh, people who are struggling in different ways. And we have to invest in uh, trying to make it better. You know, mm -hmm. that this isn't like, a, hey, if I send out the right worded statement, like it, it's going to mm -hmm. be uh, better. Like, you know, that that's not the way this works at all. Like, you know, it's like if, if you want to uh, to defeat mm -hmm. extremist ideologies, you have to invest in real solutions. And to yeah. me, you are the. I appreciate uh, that. The, par the paradigm bearer of what those solutions can and should look like. I appreciate it. And I've got a, you know, for Free Radicals project, I've got a 1 million, 3 million, 5 million, you know, multi-year plan to scale, to grow. It includes case managers around the country. It includes hiring formers as part of um, the bridge building process because they do trust formers, you know, as kind of the first person that they reach out to. But we also have a whole network of psychologists and job trainers that we're building. There are research studies that we're involved in that we're working on. And, and uh, right now, you know, again, Free Radicals has no employees, including me. I've never been paid. And we have all volunteers across the world who are helping do this work. It would really be, you know, uh, to, to help scale this and solidify it has always been a dream of mine, except sometimes and most days I feel like, you know, the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike. And if I pull my finger out of the dike, it all kind, kind of comes crumbling down. So I've enlisted people recently to kind of help build the organization around me, but we could, you know, use your support. And I'm share the plan, you know, the 1 million, 3 million, 5 million plan to grow with anybody who's interested too. Well, go to freeradicals.org, check out Christian's work, support it. If, if you want to read the book, it's outstanding. Breaking Hate. Did I move my copy? <laughs> Look at that. Um, Breaking Hate. Uh, he also wrote a book um, but before this. Um, Called White American Youth. White American Youth. Oh, yeah. Right. The, 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 that's... Um, yeah. So White American Youth was the first book. Breaking Hate is the more recent book. I uh, highly recommend them both. Freeradicals.org. Uh, Christian, you are a leader uh, mm -hmm. who's uh, doing incredibly important work. Uh, we need to support you and we need to make it so that you are not as singular as you are. Because there are many people who have struggled with what you've been through um, and they want to do better and they want to repair the harms that they've done, that they've in, inflicted upon others. We need to give them that opportunity. We need to give our country an opportunity to genuinely combat some of these ideologies because your fears, we all share. Like you if anyone sure. looks up and says, hey, do I think things are getting worse and nastier or better? Like most of us think they're getting worse and nastier yeah. for a variety of reasons. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't just worry about it. We should do something about it. And you are doing something about it every single day. So in addition to freeradicals.org, the book, um, uh, do you have uh, anything else that people would love to hear about? Uh, thanks for asking, Andrew. Uh, yeah, actually, I've got a new podcast with WBEZ in Chicago. It's an NPR affiliate in Chicago. It's called Motive Season 3, and it uh, explains the, how the white supremacist youth movement started in the mid-80s uh, and kind of morphed into what we're seeing in Charlottesville and in places today. And I think it does a really good job of explaining that. So thanks for asking. No problem. Christian Picciolini, freeradicals.org. Check him out and his work. Uh, let's support him uh, and let's uh, actually invest in some of the solutions that he's been working on for years. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate you too, my friend. Peace. Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, please do subscribe to Yang Speaks and click on notifications so we can let you know every time we have a new episode.